I play with that? <laughs> no. Good evening. Wait for that. Don't know if that came out. Yep, good evening. Hey. <laughs> Falcher, welcome. Tonight we have come together to celebrate and connect 50 years of outdoor and environmental education here at the University of Edinburgh. We are joined by nearly 200 alumni and current students representing over 14 different countries to help us achieve this. Thank you to every one of you for being with us today. We are delighted to welcome those of you who have traveled to be here in person, those of you joining us via Zoom, and those of you who are connecting with us using hashtag OEE50. We are Morgan and Nush, and we are honored to be hosting this evening's event for you. No. <laughs> Tonight we will see and hear from those who have guided, inspired, and perhaps at times challenged us. We will glimpse into the past, present, and future of OEE, share stories, and seek to build upon our alumni community. This is an opportunity to see how OEE has developed over the past 50 years, and to consider how we can all contribute to its future. Now, we don't want to take up too much time, as we need to ensure Professor Higgins has enough. <laughs> but another thing. A few housecoop housekeeping notes before we get started. For those on Zoom, could you please ensure your mics are muted? Um, uh, the university currently has no restrictions regarding the wearing of masks or social distancing, but we ask that we all consider and respect others' decisions in helping to navigate COVID-19. There are no fire alarms planned this evening, so if we hear the alarm, head for the outdoors, <laughs> calmly and safely via the nearest exit. And you are welcome to take photos, but if we can turn flashes off, I'd appreciate it, please. Thank you. To begin our night, we give a very warm welcome to Professor Richard Andrews, head of Moray House School of Education and Sport. I was hoping to run up the stairs a bit like a bomber and show how fit I was after all that climbing today, but uh, no, they're too short, but never mind. It, it's a great privilege for me to just open the session uh, this afternoon, this evening. 50 years of outdoor education is just absolutely amazing. And I feel sort of somewhat humbled and also a bit of an imposter here because, I mean, my background is not in outdoor education. Uh, I trained as an English teacher, um, but funnily enough, the things I remember from my education and what I tried to kind of do as a teacher were all about getting outdoors or bringing the outdoors into the classroom. I don't remember much from my own primary school education, but what I do remember are what we called nature walks. And uh, we went out, we took tree rubbings, we captured sticklebacks and ponds, brought it all back into the classroom, and it was absolutely a fabulous kind of memory for me, pretty much the only thing I do remember about my primary school education. Except that on one day we, we had the head teacher with us, and we also took a ball and had a kick around um, you know, during, during the nature walk. And unfortunately, the ball kind of uh, went up in the air and hit the head teacher uh, on the head, and um, she fell into a sort of muddy pool. And um, I, I actually remember very, very clearly that we picked her up and carried her back to school. It was just a great moment to have all these primary school children carrying their own head teacher back. Anyway, that was my first encounter with outdoor education, really. Then when I became a teacher, I, um, I thought, you know, this, this was the 1970s, I thought, actually, we need to liven things up a bit in this English class of kind of 13-year-olds, as it were. This was in Bedfordshire. And um, I thought, let me bring our two cats into the classroom. It was the age in English teaching of what was called English through experience. You had to have sensory experiences in order to, to write. And um, anyway, I brought my two cats into the class, thinking that all the... The, the pupils would be writing about them and describing it, writing poems and stories. And, of course, the cats got out of their basket 
and started running around up underneath the tables, over the tables, um, causing pretty much chaos. Uh, one of the cats peed in the corner of a room. Um, the kids were all out of their seats, chasing the cats around the room, trying to capture them. Uh, pretty much it was chaotic, and we had to call in the, the cleaners um, and the head teacher, and the whole 45 minutes went by in kind of total mayhem. Um, but afterwards, many years afterwards, some of the kids said to me, do you know, sir, the, the best lesson you ever did <laughs> was when you brought your cats in. And I thought, yeah, I, I enjoyed that too. We, nothing was produced other than a bit of chaos. Later, when I was in my second job, I worked in the East End of London. I took um, a lot of pupils on a writing retreat to Wales. And a lot of these uh, pupils in the East End hadn't been much out of the East End of London, very urban. Um, they certainly hadn't been to West London or, or indeed to the countryside. And we hired a cottage in Wales, we hired a, a writer to come with us. And the first evening a, a sheep came to the window of the cottage and the kids all looked out and one of them said, Sir, what is that? I said, uh, it's a sheep. And he said, is it mechanical? <laughs> I said, no, it's real. And I think, what a turning point for that young person. You know, to think that there were actually, and it's hard for us to imagine that, but there are actually creatures out there um, that were different from us. Um, and then, much later, I was uh, working in Hong Kong. We took, a, again, attempt, another attempted writer's trip to... Uh, Southwest China, uh, caste country, really beautiful limestone country, very dramatic. And um, one of the students had an incredibly heavy bag, a he heavy case. Uh, again, he was about 14, I suppose. And I said, Alistair, what is in that case that you brought on this trip? And he said, um, I don't know. Uh, my mum always packs it, but I always find everything very useful. I thought, oh, no, that's so sweet. The, the really abiding moment about outdoor education in that trip was being, uh, first of all, cycling around uh, the paddy fields, uh, whatever, all together. Um, my wife and I had a tiny baby at that point, and he was sleeping in the, the basket as we cycled around. But I, th I think the real great learning moment for, um, for the pupils was when we were on a boat on a river, and a, a boat of... Uh, local Chinese people um, came alongside very, very slowly and very close, about three feet away from us all. So we were all lined up, sort of international kids living in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, uh, the Chinese people who came up were local country people. And the faces were so close to each other. We just looked at them and they looked at us. There was complete silence. But uh, again, this is what the children remember uh, about that trip. And it's about a human dimension of outdoors, but something that you couldn't really replace online or, or in a classroom. Um, rather unfortunately, in the write-up of that, there wasn't much writing done, unfortunately, because the experience was so engaging. But um, the one thing our kids did notice was that a lot of the Chinese folk had slits in their trousers. and. Um, when we came back to give a presentation in an assembly back in the school a few weeks later, I said, you've got to be really careful about the way you say that when you're up on stage. Um, and you can imagine, you know, there were plenty of Freudian slips because they couldn't uh, manage to say slits in their trousers without getting it another word that's very close to that that I'm not going to say today. And that, of course, got me into trouble as a teacher. And everyone wondered why I was doing it. So I tell you these stories because, uh, for me, uh, I revere and celebrate today your work in outdoor education. For me, I think for everyone, and particularly for young people, getting outside the classroom, getting into wider spaces and all the emotional, spatial, adventuring, sort of understanding, uh, the empathy and humility that comes from that, and the camaraderie is so special. The last thing I want to say is that um, often 
that notion of outdoor education is at the edge of curricular thinking in schools and in universities. Uh, but I'm really pleased to say, and thanks to uh, all our colleagues and yourselves, that at Murray House, it's getting ever more central to our thinking about the curriculum. So much so that the university is undertaking a very big curriculum transformation project. And uh, with the help of colleagues uh, across the university, I'm in the privileged position of putting together a report on the future of postgraduate teaching in the university. And I can tell you that outdoor and environmental sustainability education, along with a couple of other key elements and aspects or dimensions, will be central to the future of Edinburgh's conception of what postgraduate education is about from the mid, about the mid-decade onwards. So with a tribute to my immediate colleagues, Pete Higgins, Robin Nicholl, Heidi Smith, Beth Christie, Dave Clark, Alison Parker, and the wonderful Learning uh, for Sustainability team, I warmly welcome all of you. It's wonderful to be together. Uh, I hope we'll have lots of conversation over the evening. Thank you very much for coming, and congratulations on your work. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now over to the main act, uh, Pete Higgins. <laughs> Don't spoil it. Richard's just said that we're going to be mainstreamed. Tonight, you could easily just ruin it. As long as you behave properly, Richard can take back a positive message about what outdoor environmental and sustainability education does. We're back in the mainstream of the University of Edinburgh, which is a bizarre thing to be able to say when you think about it, when you think about what a university is and the University of Edinburgh is. Now, um, there's a number of different histories that anyone, that anyone can... Um, can, can provide, I suppose, when it comes to a narrative like this. This um, history that I'm about to present is one that's very personal. It's one that um, I, I suppose I've lived parts of anyway, and yet there are a bunch of other histories. And I want to start by saying that as much as we think it's 50 years, it's actually not. It's 80 years. And the reason I know it's 80 years is because Nev Crowther, sitting over there, one, one of uh, our previous members of staff uh, told me about this many years ago. And what I'd like to do now is just take you through a few slides which give you the, the technical history. Then after that, there's going to be a bit more of a sort of looser history um, with a few more images. So if you'll bear with me, um, I'll just start the slides. Now, if it works, if it works, what am I... Not, hey, there we are. So, this is my point that actually the past is a different place. It's a different country. Everything changes over the years and we don't necessarily know what's changed, but we tend to look back and think, oh, it wasn't like that in my day. And there, these are incremental changes. And each of us has our own history with this program and the program has its own history, but we write our history. The, those who aren't here can't write that history. And we're in the privileged position of taking this longer view, um, partly because we had a celebration 25 years ago now that Nev and um, my other predecessor, John Cheeseman, wrote an article about. So that's available for you to read if you wish. Now, if I can direct you to uh, these, these um, key points. Now, it's hard for me because I'm, I need to look at the microphone and I need to look at that at the same time. Let me see if I can do this by using my laptop here. So the first of these was back in 1940s, the late 1940s, students from what was Murray House College of Education went to, um, uh, uh, the, uh, down into the borders on a regular basis doing outdoor educational activities. And they, uh, they went with uh, Glenmore Lodge staff. Um, no, I'm, I'm getting my two colleges mixed up. Went up into the Cairngorms with Glenmore Lodge staff and had experiences that were technical outdoor activity courses, really, there. 
1970, the first outdoor lecturer was appointed, and this is Eric Langmuir, and a number of you will immediately go, what, the Eric Langmuir? Yes, the one who wrote Mountain Craft and Leadership. Uh, he was principal of Glenmore Lodge, and then he um, took an appointment at, at what was Murray House College then. In the 70s and 80s, there was an elective running for teachers, up to about 600 in total, went through at about 20 to 40 a year on that elective programme that Eric rang. 1972 to 1987, the Diploma in Outdoor Education started. Now, this was, note the year, 1972, 50 years back from this year. The emphasis being on outdoor education, uh, activities, time in wildland, but also a broader environmental base. Now, Nev was appointed in 1972, along with Bob Smith from Glenmore Lodge, another, another member of staff from there, Bob Laurie, uh, and one or two others. But by 1987, the only person left was Nev. The others had gone off to do other things. Uh, this advert here is the advert for the lectureship for um, uh, a lecturer in outdoor education back in 1972. I'm not sure where it came from, but whoever provided it, it was a, 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 a wonderful thing to be able to see. The Mountain Craft and Leadership book there is because of Eric. Um, and also this building was the building that Nev uh, told me they eventually moved into, having been moved out of the main part of Murray House um, College, when things were kind of rough in the, in the, um, in the middle years, say in the, between 1970 and 1987. And that building is still there, it's still derelict. Uh, well, not quite derelict, but it's boarded up, and that's a picture I took only um, just a few days ago. Okay, moving on. So, in the 1950s um, to 1987, at Dunfermline College of PE. Now, Dunfermline College was based in Aberdeen back in the day, in the, the early 1950s, and eventually it was moved to Cramond. And some of you will have been students at Cramond. So, uh, there was a, a course that was a one-week course that was run up in the Cairngorms, again facilitated by, uh, by a key member of staff, Ben Humble, and he was the person who instigated mountain rescue teams in Scotland. So you started to get a feeling about how the people of these, these programs were linked into the mainstream, Glenmore Lodge mountain rescue teams, etc. And it was a range of activity courses. Down in the bottom left here, you can see an image from that time of women, as it, wa it was women, because it was a women's college, um, up in the Cairngorms, um, in an area where they're about to go skiing. It was no lifts then, you carried your, your gear up and you skied back down. In the 1960s, a lot of growth at Dunfermline College, which had subsequently moved to Cramond, um, and it was based at this lease college down in Estelle Muir, uh, the lease cottage in Estelle Muir. Um, 1970-72, appointment of staff Liam Carver, another from Glenmore Lodge, John Cheesemond uh, from Ogwin Cottage in North Wales, a very, very famous outdoor centre. Um, and they developed a curricular program for PE students, which ran for three months in the summer term, and it was discontinued in 1985. Now, in that period, 1972, a really significant thing happened for many of us, which was Woodlands was purchased up in Kingusi in the Cairngorms for eight and a half thousand pounds. Now, um, this became a really important base for many of the, the, the courses which followed subsequently. I'll talk more about it later. 1973 to 75, growing interest in the B.Ed., P.E., and so remember, we're still talking about a college that focused on physical education and the development of outdoor education led by Alan Hunt, again, somebody who'd worked at Glenmore Lodge, Carol McNeil, an international orienteer, in fact, a world champion orienteer, and Barry Smith, a very eminent sea kayaker and mountaineer. Um, and then in 1978, a diploma in recreation and leisure was established, and that eventually became a B.A., in, uh, in recreation and then a BA in leisure studies and one or two people in this room did that degree including my wonderful colleague Beth Christie over there. So um, this history of that PE college was then consolidated with the merger with Murray House Institute of Education in 1987. So the college at, at Holyrood that some of you will know, the college at Cramond that some of you, you will know were brought together with another college, a teacher education college, a PE college, Jordan Hill College in Glasgow at the Cramond campus. And what a wonderful site it was, a purpose-built building with all sorts of extensive grounds around it, etc. And, and, and it, was a, it became the base for the development of this diploma in outdoor education 
because Nev was moved up to Holyrood, from Holyrood to Cramond. The other staff who were there uh, alongside him, uh, John Cheeseman in particular, validated the course at, um, at, through the, the Council for National Academic Awards, and then eventually that became the postgraduate diploma uh, in outdoor education in 1992. Um, once it was validated by Harriet Watt in 1990. And I can remember now um, one or two individuals from the courses in the year just before I started in 1992 describing in some detail how John Cheesemond was a, a broken man by trying to get the paperwork together to develop this existing programme into a postgraduate programme validated by Harriet Watt. Note we were linked with Harriet Watt at that time. I had no idea why it was such hard work because I'd never tried to validate a program, but I have since, and I know why John was broken. Uh, so in 1995, we, we revalidated the outdoor education program as a master's degree. And you can see the memorandum here because we used to do this. We used to type up these memoranda and send them off to people. So this was me writing to my boss, David Bayman, to say we need to have one of these master's degrees because if we don't do it, somebody else will. We are with all due humility, world leading, by the way, David. Um, it's not gonna cost you anything, by the way. Um, and what we'll do is we'll build this program and we'll validate it through Harriet Watt, which is what we did. Now, I arrived in 1992, and you can see that was a, a memo from 1993, I think. It was 95 we validated, we started the validation program. And some of you in this room are amongst the first people to have ever got a master's degree through that program. Um, and then, John and Ali and Nev and Barry all retired. And then we appointed two new staff, Anne Salisbury and Pete Gwatkin. Now, next, Murray House School of Education, the University of Edinburgh. All right, you can see the little badge up now. I'm doing a bit of scent marking with the University of Edinburgh badge. So we, we, we merged. A lot of people talked about it as a takeover in, 19, uh, in 1998. And we were relocated to Holyrood in 2001 and we moved into the PE building which is what you can see in the bottom left here and then we really started getting going with program development we produced a, ba a bachelor's degree in outdoor education as you can see we worked with the geography department to do this and that lasted for a few years um, we built in alongside our existing masters in outdoor education one in outdoor environmental and sustainability education we redeveloped a PGDE outdoor education elective, which ran, stopped running, and is now running again. And then uh, an MSc in learning for sustainability to complement these two other master's programs, so a suite of three. Um, and then we started working much broadly, much more broadly across the university. Uh, I started a social and uh, sustainability and social responsibility online course. Well, what's an outdoor educator doing developing an online course? Well, actually, because a lot of students want this and can benefit from it. And so I work with other colleagues, we developed that, and since then we've done a, a number of other online courses and uh, other developments which have been very um, fruitful, actually. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Staff appointments, you can see loads. Pete Allison, Alison Lugg, Robbie Nicholl, Simon Beams, Beth Christie, John Telford, Heidi Smith, Dave Clark, etc. Now, only a couple of those are here still. So Beth's here, Robbie's here. Well, he's up there in, in Kingusi because he's got COVID. Um, and, and, um, and Heidi. And so um, we, we built this, th 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 much of this, this program development um, was the, the work of these people who are not here now or are still present. Then we got a couple of research fellows, Roger Scrutton, Yul Hildman, and Ramsey Afifi. They all came along in a relatively short period of time and actually complemented our work enormously with their intellect and their energy. Um, through this period, there were all sorts of validations, revalidations, and program developments. And it's the way things happen within university context that you have to continually justify why you're there. I will just make mention of this, uh, that Beth in particular has led uh, the development of MOOCs in learning for sustainability. And these uh, are massive open access online courses, and they're available to people all over the world. And they've been really successful, and I've worked with her on these. And one of the things that they've done is they've brought in a much broader community of interest and people have arrived to do this program, these programs of ours, because they've seen the MOOCs. Um, but that's not why we've done them. We've done them because we thought they were important. But one of the points that Richard was making there about embedding what we do in the university has come about because we've been able 
to work online, and we've been able to do these MOOCs as well. So, right, that's a kind of technical history. Um, can I move to a few pictures now? You must be, the little, the little postcard in the middle here is because, of course, we had to market a lot of what we did here, and I'll return to that. And many of you will know that this is the building that we're now located in, um, down at Holyrood. Okay, so, um, back in the day, and I'm going to say back in the day quite a few times now. Um, back in the day, um, the gear was not the kind of gear that you'd expect to use today. So, this, a lot of this stuff came out of my cupboard, right? It was never mine. I'm far too young to have used any of it, of course, but it came out of my cupboard. And these pictures are John Cheeseman's, and you can see that the world was a little bit different in terms of the technical gear that you had. Um, when, you've, when these programs first started. But actually, um, it's not just the programs that, that have changed, the information that was available. So over on the left-hand side is the first proper book about outdoor education. All sorts of people have written all sorts of books. But this is by Catherine Loder, Cairngorm Adventure at Glenmore, written in 1952. Um, and I recommend it. Uh, it, it describes not just outdoor activity work at Glenmore Lodge, the National Mountaineering Outdoor Centre in the Cairngorms, but also a lot of environmental work that was done there back in the day. Um, you wanted to learn to rock climb? Well, you'd get this Loughborough series of books, or you'd get uh, um, a bit more education from Education in the Mountain Centres by, ha by Harold Drasdow, 1972, and then uh, Colin Mortlock's book, Ed Adventure Education, here. Now, Colin's very keen to tell me um, you know, a number of times that his was the first ever book about outdoor education. I'd say, ah, ha, 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 ha. Ah, ha, ha. Harold Drasdow was before you, but Catherine Loder was way before him, 20 years before him. Um, and so Colin eventually wrote The Adventure Alternative, quite a, a famous book. But if you wanted to, to look to, to explore the rivers of the UK, you'd go to these old coaching handbooks and guidebooks. And Mountain Craft and Leadership here, Eric Langmuir's um, book, was supplemented in terms of mountaineering skills by Alan Blackshaw's book on mountaineering written in 1965. So these were the kinds of things that were available. So those of us who were working on the programs back in 1972 when I arrived and before that weren't really contributing to a literature. They were too busy out there doing stuff. Um, and Nev would tell me, uh, you know, that back in the day he would just turn up at college at the beginning of the academic year and say, I need a bag of money and he'd go away with a bag of money with the students. And then he'd come back at the end of the year and say, that's the remains of your money. There's not much, by the way, and give these students a diploma. Uh, the world is really rather different now. Okay, um, a home from home. Um, so I mentioned the old Kirk, which is in the top left here. Someday, one day, and I did actually campaign for this a little while back to see whether we, could, um, we, we might be able to move back into it. Um, because we'd rattle around in there, but it would be quite nice to have that historic resonance of going back to the place we came from originally down at um, Murray House at, at, at Holyrood. And right in the middle here is Woodlands. And Woodlands, of course, for many of you, represented many weeks of your time on this program. And a, a, a remarkable and wonderful uh, location it was there up in the Cairngorms. And, of course... The Cairngorms has loomed large for many of us, for many of the programs over the years. So I've chosen a picture of a river here. You might know it. It's the River Spey. And of course, the mountains are up in the back left. But this water comes from those mountains. And many of you, you will know that I used to be a freshwater ecologist. So rivers are important. Yeah, you're all laughing now. But you wait till I get to the salmon slides. There, you'll not be <laughs> laughing then. So... so <laughs> God, dear. I'm going to have to compose myself. I was getting excited there about the thought of talking to you about salmon. Um, <laughs> so, so the mountains feed the rivers. And, of course, the rivers feed the mountains because, of course, they feed the seas. And the Cairngorms has been probably the primary location for the things that we do and the places that we go. But there's another one that is very close to my heart and Nev's heart and actually... I suspect many of you, uh, the Isle of Rum. And some of you poor souls have just spent a week with me there and were just back a few weeks ago. Um, and we didn't get to stay in this castle here that many of you have stayed in. Uh, we stayed in a rather nice purpose-built hostel, but it's not like staying in the castle um, and uh, you know, roaming about that building. 
but it, it's, it's a remarkable thing that we run this program uh, partly on the Isle of Rum. And Nev, um, again, I'm referring to him, he, he told me the story of how he contacted the Director General of the Nature Conservancy Council in 1972-73. His name was John Morton Boyd, and a famous ecologist, and said, um, uh, can we just go and visit your island? It was a national nature reserve back then, but it was a forbidden island. Nobody was allowed to go there um, other than for biological reasons. And he sweet-talked him into um, allowing us to take programs to the island, to our students to take, to take them to the island. And um, since that year, 1974, when Nev managed to organise it to happen for the first time, we've gone every year apart from the two COVID years. Even during the foot and mouth disease uh, year, we managed to get over there. And um, it's, it's a place where many of you will know that you've been able to explore uh, a range of ecological and other aspects of your learning, but also to explore the place up onto the Kulin, um, looking at the sheer waters in the middle of night, um, going over to Kilmory to see the deer, uh, and heading off uh, on other parts of the island on your self-programmed days in more recent years. And of course, having to listen to me talk about, oh, look, there's Narthesia morsifraga. Oh, uh, and oh yeah, you know, that's um, uh, Pelvisia canaliculata, and you know, um, and yeah, there are one or two of you. Be quiet. Uh, some, uh, she knows what I'm what uh, what I'm referring to, and and I know these names because of Nev, because I actually recognise the importance of learning some scientific names um, on uh, that were relevant to my teaching there, and and actually uh, a number of people have pointed out that the only scientific names I actually know are the ones that I use on rum, but I try to use them. Um, how can I put this? Educatively and entertainingly. Um, all right, so that's rum. Um, and um, the <laughs> it, 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 I've spent over a year of my life there now, and I think Nev's spent probably more than that. John Cheeseman says he spent more than three years of his life up at Woodlands, so I've probably spent about a year of my life at Woodlands as well. So these are important places to us. Okay, now, um, and then uh, there are other places as well. We, th these these programmes have explored many parts of Scotland and also the rest of the UK, or at least parts of the rest of the UK, particularly the Lake District, the Peak District for caving, etc., rock climbing, um, but also then much farther afield. And um, there was a, a long period where uh, one of the standard things on the programme was to do an expedition at the end of the year. We discontinued it a few years ago. Some of you more recent students will be sad to hear that for various reasons. We, we, we made that decision and it, I think it was the right decision at the time because we couldn't manage the rest of the program and it became such a huge feature of what we did that it made it difficult to continue it. But these are just a selection of the reports that students prepared uh, following their expeditions. And these expeditions had a big lead in, there was a lot of preparation and that's why I say it, it became a huge and overriding part of the program. So lots of other countries as well. And then, of course, the three circles. Now, I get ridiculed because almost everything I ever try to um, explain involves three circles. Well, there's three circles and four circles here. The three circles were dreamt up primarily by um, our lovely colleague Ali Morgan back in 95 when we were trying to devise uh, a, a justification for the way in which we ran our programs. And you can see this more complex figure on the right-hand side, which was part of the original validation document to get our masters in outdoor education validated as a masters. And what we did was we built the courses around these three ideas about outdoor activities, about environmental education, and about personal and social learning, personal and social ed education. And the outdoor education was kind of in the middle of that, but all within a framework of safe and professional practice. So the idea was that you could roam about in any one or more of these areas at any one time. And you might be delivering environmental education as a teacher, but you'd also have personal and social issues in mind, and you might well be doing an adventure activity while you're doing it. Um, now, that became kind of embedded in the psyche of what we do for good or ill and maybe it's time that somebody came up with another idea but Robbie came up with another idea during his PhD which was that we should think about learning as taking place within these different zones from the school if it's an educational endeavour associated with formal education the school to the local neighbourhood to day excursions and then overnight stays farther afield 
Now, as all good academics, we need to conceptualize this further. And of course, here is a more detailed explication of what we mean by these three circles. And of course, you can see now that this fits in with recreation, it fits in with environment, it fits in with sustainability, health and well-being, and of course, these existing areas of interest. Why do we do that? Because we're insecure. Um, John Cheeseman used to say, subjects that are secure don't call themselves education. They just do maths, they just do English, they do history, they do French, they don't do education, as in physical education. Sorry guys, but you're insecure. Um, colleagues from PE over here, well, physical education. You're insecure, health education, outdoor education. So we're insecure, we need to justify what we do, and we damn well had to justify what we do, because it became very important to give a rationale for why we did what we did. Um, and I'll go on to that now. So a journey down the spay doesn't just be a journey down, the, down doesn't become just a journey down the spay. You link it up with a whole range of things that are, that are important to learn about and to learn um, the connections between. So this idea of learning in, through, about, and for the environment. What's wrong with that? Nothing at all. What's difficult about it? Joining up these things. Why is interdisciplinary education so hard? Because people don't take learners into the places where they can learn from those places, the affordances of those places, as some of us might say. Right, now, we need to start writing a few books. Of course we do. So this is the first book that I was, the first book that I was involved in, which was with Nev, just as a guide for outdoor educators in Scotland. There was nothing. And then the book on the right that many of you will know that Simon and Robbie and I produced about 10 or 12 years ago. And there's another one coming off, hot off the presses, we really hope, a bit later this year. So you, you're starting to explain what we do to a broader audience. Now, um, there's one kind of odd picture out here. And I can tell you that um, it's probably not what you think it is. Now, what do you think it is? <laughs> As if that wasn't daunting. For outdoor educators, is there one picture? And one in the classroom. Now, why have I shown you one in the classroom? It's not because it's in a classroom. There's nothing wrong with being in the classroom. Look at the number. Heavens, you know, how can we teach that number of students outdoors? Now, each of these other images are of whole groups of students. So you're looking at about a dozen from the first year in 1972 or fewer. And actually, the number of students on your program is really crucial to your managers. Where is he? Over there, Richard. Um, it's really important because they have budgets to manage. And we need to be serious about that. So um, I'd like to give you a metric here. Recruitment is important. Overseas recruit, recruitment more so. Thank you to all you overseas students. You have allowed us to survive. So here's, you know I like equations here. So, you know, international fees are I because they're much higher. Um, and so R times F plus O times I is lots of money. This is important, okay. Now, um, and of course, that means that you, the students, have had to find the funds, pay for accommodation, give up employment, and leave your homes. Thank you, thank you. I really mean it, because we wouldn't be here without those sacrifices that you've made, those commitments that you've made. So, it's all about the money then, isn't it? Well, it isn't quite, but actually we have had to strive to recruit, so that's why we, we went through all this development of all our mar marketing stuff, etc. None of it was particularly good. I don't know how we ever recruited students, because mostly that was rubbish. But, 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 but also, we, we started writing. We thought, we, we realised that we had to because we were part of the University of Edinburgh um, from, since the merger or the takeover, depending on what you call it. And so we as academics have had to write and we've continued to write. And we actually feel it's really important that we do because we need to be able to explain and justify what we do within an academic audience and to others outside. But we also need to communicate. Now, we're quite good communicators on the whole, but we tend to communicate within our own little worlds, and that is always a hazard. Now, now it gets really serious. The first ever PhD in outdoor education in the UK, probably Europe, was Robbie Nichols in 2001. <laughs> now, I was his supervisor. I'm a fish biologist. What can you say? Absolutely no idea how that happened. 
But actually, the one on the left should have been the first PhD, John Cheeseman's master's degree, 1981. You'll note it's fatter than any of the others, but John submitted it, the hum humble man that he was, for a master's degree, rather than say, well, this is a PhD. But this was the first PhD, Robbie's, Beth's was the next, John's was later, and the reason I put the three of them there is that there are three members of staff who all came to work on the program at some point later, and all now have or are supervising doctoral students themselves. 32 completions since 2001, another important metric, and then there's about 13 more kind of in the pipeline. Now, that's another important metric, and, and here are a few more. So income generation from grants and consultancy, managers need to know how much money you're bringing in. Actually, we have brought in millions, and, and, it, and we've done good things with that money. Um, and Betsy over there, my wonderful colleague, from Learning for Sustainability Scotland is, is in post uh, partly because we have been able to bring in money for Learning for Sustainability Scotland to do things. This is important. Publications are important, books and papers, PhD completion, completions, and then our impact case study ranking. So you, could, you can actually write an equation which essentially says we are here now because of this double pounds from the fees, the pounds from the consultancy and grants, the P plus B plus PhDs plus impact case studies. It's all part of our jobs now. It's a much richer environment in that sense, but actually it takes us away quite a bit from a lot of the outdoor stuff. And some of you, I think, will probably have wondered on occasion why we're not all out with you all the time. Right, a bit more on, on policy now. I just want to say that none of this happens in a vacuum and actually what you need to do is justify what you're doing within a policy context within a university and also within uh, a, a location, like in our case in Scotland. And so we've worked hard at that. And we have written things, we've done research, and we have established the uh, UN Centre that Betsy works in for sustainability education. And we've worked w actively with Parliament in order to be sure that we were engaging with Scottish policymakers. Some of you students were laughing at me the other day because I was wearing a suit and a tie. And, and why? Because I was off hobnobbing with politicians. And this, if you get those opportunities, you have to take them uh, for good reason. And amongst the things that we, we, we did, we, we started to do research that linked with policy. We started to try to build curriculum and formal education together with the outdoors. Charma Smith over there has been very active at one point in trying to ensure that the, um, the, the curriculum became policy focused. Rob Bushby has been heavily involved. He's uh, around here somewhere. And then uh, linking with sustainability as an idea is a crucial um, aspect of the work that certainly I've been involved in. Now, I'm nearly done, but I want to make mention of about two or three other things. This context is a live issue today, and, and hence the meetings that I was in over the last couple of days with people from the Parliament. Um, but Scotland is a, is a remarkable place. It's a remarkable place to work and live, and I'm not moving anywhere ever again, I'm sure. Um, and it's partly remarkable because you can make stuff happen if you get the right time and you approach things in the right way. And these were examples of this. This Curriculum for Excellence for Outdoor Learning is the only formal policy document that I, I know existed in the world when it was, um, when it was produced, focusing on outdoor learning. There are now one or two others, but it, this is still there as a kind of landmark. And the same with Vision 2030 Plus, embedding learning for sustainability and the entitlement of all learners and the requirements of all professional teachers and others, uh, education professionals. But here's another one. Um, access to the land and waters of Scotland. Not every country has this. You go south of the border, it's not like this. You go over to Ireland, it's not like this. Access to the countryside is profoundly important for us as educators and for people to recreate. Some bizarre people out there think that they own land and they think they can control access to it, and they do. It ain't right. But people have fought against that for years, and one of the key people who has, who wasn't really associated with this program, was Alan Blackshaw, but he wrote the first book on mountaineering, per se. And these are articles that Alan wrote. He was uh, an incredibly erudite individual, arguing that the customary traditions of access to the countryside had to be enshrined in law. And in 2003, we, um, we, I was involved in it, uh, lots of people were involved in it, um, developed the, the legislation which is now the Land, um, the Land Reform Scotland 2003 Act, 
Um, there are people in this room who contributed to that as well. One other person who contributed very vigorously and actively is Andy Whiteman, who many of you know, was an MSP here, now lives up in the Highlands again. And, and having these rights is really important. And, and educating young people or older people about their rights of access to the countryside and getting them out there is really important. You can't do this in a classroom. You need to get out there in order to show that it is important. Two more slides, um, I think maybe three. Um, this is a director of outdoor education centres published in 1982, and you can see where they were located all over Scotland. Almost all of those have closed down now. Um, and the reason they've closed down has been money. It's been money and because outdoor education hasn't been mainstreamed. Now, why does all this policy stuff matter? Well, it matters because if you want it to be real, it does need to be mainstreamed. Uh, in, in schools. Now, around the world, outdoor recreation is thriving. It's thriving in Scotland. But actually, you need to help young people to take those opportunities to get out there so that they can get the benefits too. Now, there's a, there's a bill being prepared at the moment. Rob's involved in it, and I'm involved in it, to try to, um, to, to, to enshrine outdoor learning as part of Scottish Government policy. So we'll see how that goes. But we're working on it, and lots of people are. One of the casualties of, of things closing down, nothing to do with that, that, that set of closures, but again, due to money was woodlands. And you know, I should have a rest in peace sign here. But this book on, on um, the, uh, the history of Dunfermline College of Education, its final paragraphs talk about the importance of outdoor activity courses being run at, at, at woodlands. And this is a group sitting there with Robbie up at woodlands, uh, just outside the base that we many of us used and it was sold in 2018. Richard, I have to say, has been very active in supporting the argument that we do need a base somewhere. And not just a base for our students, but for all the university students who are interested in finding out more about the outdoors. My heroes. There are one of, the, one of them over there, Neville Crowther. That's his Sunday name, he always says, Nev Crowther. And all, anybody, anybody who's been to run with me knows that I talk about him constantly. And John Cheeseman, who died last year. They are the two who brought the two programs together, merged them, and came up with the postgraduate diploma in the end, which became the Masters. And this was what became my office in Crammond uh, after John retired and I moved in. And I had his shoes to stand in, and then about four other people's. And then Nev, within a year, I had his shoes as well. Um, so great people who've done amazing things. So thank you to Nev and thank you to John for all your vision and energy back then. And that's a personal from me, but I'm sure you'll get it from these people. Um, and then finally, um, uh, 25 years on, we're still here. We're still here. And wouldn't it be wonderful to think that there's another 25 and another 25 years of these programs? Not because the programs are important in and of themselves. It's the ideas that are important and we need to make sure we foster that. This is my final slide because I wanted to tell you that these are personal histories. I love this rough Russian proverb, the past is unpredictable. And, and I'm rapidly becoming part of that past and there are many of you in this room are thinking it's about time he really was past. But, um, but certainly uh, th this is a view. You'll all have your own views, you'll have your own histories they are the important things, not the one that I've just given you just now. And I'm sorry I've been about three or four minutes more than I should have been. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete, for sharing the history and development of OEE. We now have a short film produced and edited by OEE alumnus, Catherine Dunn. We wish to give a big thank you to Murray House School of Education and Sport for commissioning and funding this project. And a special thank you to all the alumni and staff who supported and took part. The origins of the current programmes began in 1972, finding a home with Murray House in 1998. The Certificate, Diploma and Masters programmes continue to flourish and diversify as we celebrate 50 years of outdoor and environmental education at the University of Edinburgh. 
The outdoor and environmental education programs are world leading and the longest running graduate programs in the field. Many alumni have gone on to complete doctoral studies to further the international standing of the programs. They offer a broad base for a professional career in outdoor and environmental education through a variety of learning approaches. Whether undertaken full or part time, the impact of the programs has been profound for our alumni. Of all the experiences that I've had in life, I think that was probably one of the most transformative and impactful experiences of, of my, my life. It gave me a real respect for every aspect of the environment. Critically examining my own practice, uh, whether I've done the same thing 10 times to still critically examine it the 11th time. I think it shaped really the direction of my life after. <laughs> The program design itself is like the best thing I think about this program. As I said, like theory informing practice, practice informing theory and like self-exploration rather than like giving us a teaching formula. We all went down canoeing on the spay and we created such an amazing bond with each other. And that program, that PDP actually set the tone for the strong bond the entire cohort had with each other. I really liked when we went to rum and I really loved when we went and walked up at night time to wait for the Manx year waters to come in to look at the rings on them and find out about them. One of the ones that I'm most fond of is when we went to Rum. We kind of worked up to everyone having a day where they could plan their own adventure on the last day. I saw a lot of growth within myself because I really took to that opportunity, whereas in the past I think I would have sat back and let other people plan something like that. People coming from different experiences, not just like from different places, but from different experience level, like uh, people who have just graduated or have like a lot of experience and different perspectives. So all this combination is like, I think is really a good highlight for me personally. <laughs> I think even in Western countries, it's not a very common program. It's quite unique. I talked with my English friends or American friends, they were like, well, it sounds real and I want to take it. Wonderful, beautiful journey that continues. Friendship. Motivational. Inspirational. Emotional. And transformation. Transformative. Surprising. Challenging. The gateway to an enjoyable career. Supportive. Laughter. Liberating for me. Thank you, Catherine, for capturing such uh, beautiful and inspiring memories. Um, I feel, feel quite heartwarmed. <laughs> um, unfortunately, Professor Robbie Nicholl is unable to join us in person, uh, so he's joining us via Zoom to share the plans and aspirations for the future of outdoor education. Thank you. Welcome, Robbie.
in his presentation. So perhaps that's uh, something that I'll try to do. Uh, but I'm really sorry not to be drawing you. Uh, as Pete mentioned, I do, I do have a COVID, and uh, it'll probably be next week for I'm going to join the rest of humanity. So for the moment, I'm locked up in my King UC cave, uh, imagining you locked down and having a good time. Uh, I hope you do, but don't have too good a time. <laughs> okay, can I get the next slide, please? Right. If you're looking at the slide and you think these kayaks are relatively modern, that's suggesting you're probably um, near the beginning of the 50 years that we're talking about rather than the end. Um, they are in fact old uh, kayaks, of course. Um, and if you think about some of the things that people say, well, how did we get from here, um, and I can have the next slide please, um, to here. Um, and here is, I could have used, I suppose, lots of different models to try and describe where I think we are here as a launching point into the future. But I chose this one because I like it, this, this um, model called Donut Economics. Um, you'll be pleased to know that um, I won't be describing it in detail, so don't worry about you'll you'll have your dinner quite soon. Um, I will not. I will keep to time, and like <clears throat> some people. Um, but just just briefly, if 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 I may, if you if we think about the idea of the donut, the the circle in the middle is is something to do with the issues that uh, everybody should have. Everybody should have water. Everybody should have food, health, networks, education, gender equality, social. Ec everybody should have these things. It's a social foundation. And yet, there's an ecological ceiling to the way that humanity lives. Um, so, for example, some of those things on the outside, climate change, ocean acidification, chemical pollution. Um, there's a sense in which we've sort of overshot a lot of these already. Uh, and those people who have been listening to the debates that uh, have been going on at uh, COP, in, in the recent COP, meeting in Glasgow um, and many, many others will know that um, we have overshot many of these things. Um, and so there's a problem. Um, and so looking forward, um, well, you might ask, well, what's this got to do with edu outdoor education? And my question back to us all would be, well, everything. It's everything to do with outdoor education. And that's become really the focus of our work, something to do with the things that you can see here in Donut Economics. Um, and so I think the, the, the way in which we think about outdoor education, as I will hopefully show, has changed quite significantly over time. Um, next slide, please. Okay, paddles and politics. Um, as Pete has described, outdoor education was, and we can test, remains a radical experiment. It's still an experiment, I believe. It's still something that we need to play around with. It's still something we don't have the answers to. We don't know how to live sustainability, sustainably. We still need to explore ways to do it. We still don't know how to live with, without inequality in our lives. We need to keep exploring these things. And we need to find better educational responses to them. Um, and so a radical experiment would suggest something to do with counterculture, counter-institutional. Yet here we are as a, as a, as a group of um, aged and some younger uh, pa paddlers and ex hippies and lots of other adjectival type of people working in one of the world's top research intensive universities. Um, now, how did that happen? And how is that going to, how are we going to survive into the future with all the agendas that are being placed upon universities as they are at the moment? Well, we've got 50 years of survival. Um, 
and that includes COVID too. We've survived. Now, that might not seem to be a large achievement, but I think you will realise how big an achievement is. Now, I can't see anybody there, um, so I'm, I need you to help me. Um, now, can you see Heidi Smith there? Um, can, sh can somebody shout and let me know if they can see Heidi Smith? I can't hear you. Yes, somebody can see Heidi. Great. Can somebody see Beth Christie? Can't hear you. Yeah, gotcha. Right. Our program directors who have seen us through uh, COVID. Can you give them a huge big round of applause, please? Are they standing up and taking this applause? Make them stand. Well, I hope they're embarrassed. And it's okay, I'm in King UC, I feel safe. Okay, um, that's part of how we survive into the future, uh, with good people at the helm. And um, Heidi and Beth are two of the best. So thanks to them for all they've done and keeping the programmes moving along as, as, they, as they have done. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I have to say, as Pete said before, uh, practical work remains a cornerstone of the programmes. Um, now, that might seem obvious to um, you as, as people are attending this, uh, this event, but it's increasingly difficult to us as, as members of staff when there are so many other things that we need to be doing for the university to be university uh, people. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I think we would be they would need to sort of like drag us out in our coffins before we uh, gave up the, the practical work that um, of, of the programmes because it really is the, the practical work that becomes the, the way in which we emphasise and live our values. So without that, uh, I don't know where we'd be. Uh, we'd be looking for other jobs um, or looking to win the lottery. Um, can I have on the next slide, please? Thanks. Right, so I, I suppose um, thinking, thinking forward, thinking about our programmes, uh, thinking about developing further our global community and alumni, that's what we want to do. But it's not just our programmes. Uh, increasingly, we're, we're being asked to talk to other uh, programmes in uh, our school, uh, in other schools, in other areas of the university, uh, such as the vet school, the chaplaincy, uh, to groups of engineers, to groups of um, people studying nursing and medicine. So increasingly, we've been asked to to um, to speak uh, to these groups, and it's not always um, because of our outdoor education, outdoor and environmental education background. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not, and I think it's simply because. I think we think differently from other people when you think about uh, the idea that uh, most of our work happens when we cross thresholds, when we move from the outdoors, uh, rather from the indoors to the outdoors uh, and back again and constantly moving through these thresholds help us to sort of raise issues about where is the best place to teach, what is the best thing to teach and where. Uh, and how will we do that? To, to be more question focused in the way that we're thinking about um, how to provide pedagogical answers to things like interdisciplinarity, etc. So I think we've had to be adept, agile thinkers to, um, for, for people to want to sort of ask us to join in their pro programmes. And I think that's a huge privilege um, and something that we enjoy and something that's humbling because um, who wants to go to the vet school and sort of like uh, advise uh, some incredibly intelligent uh, aspirant vets about sort of interdisciplinarity? Um, well, it takes a fairly humble approach, I think, to be able to sort of like think that you have something to contribute there. Um, but I think we do so as best we can. Of course, our research is important and Pete's talked about that, so I, I won't say very much uh, about that. Our political activism, I think we are activists at heart, 
perhaps activists with a capital A, sometimes with a small a, whatever that means. But I think we want to see changes in our value, uh, in the way that our, our institution works, in the way that our university is. Um, and those are things that are just part of our, almost our DNA. We want to see change and, and we want to work with people. And it's so incredibly pleasing to see um, people, former heads of school um, online, Rowena Arshad and Pamela Mann, great supporters of our programme in the past, um, themselves activists in their own ways, um, and all people with whom we, we have uh, worked with in the past and, would, uh, have, have, and, and whose advice we still seek out uh, in, in the way that uh, we, we, we look towards the future. So just a shout out to these guys who, are, uh, who, who have joined us online. And there's a big chat going there that I can see. I'm not sure if other people can see it in the room as well, but there's a, a lovely chat going on, on there at the moment. Um, okay. Right. Now, the outdoors. How does this define our identity now and in the future? Well, increasingly, we find that the outdoors is not the defining characteristic of our work. Now, that might seem strange. And I say that hesitantly because, it, of course, it is. Um, but I think also it's it's the way in which you know if you if you think about something like risk assessment, um, and it's something that we do just all of the time um, as good people working in the outdoors. You you always do a risk assessment. You're always your antenna is always up for danger. So when COVID came along, the university did blink. It blinked hard. It closed its doors for nigh on two years. Um, and our programmes, thanks to, largely to Heidi, our programmes managed to survive and thrive during that period. Um, and I think it's because we risk assessed everything. The university blinked, we didn't. COVID was simply another risk to be assessed and we assessed it well and <clears throat> excuse me and um, and so it is and I think that's why um, that that's what makes the possibility for good pedagogy and I think that's why the university is so interested in the way we work because you know if we get it wrong when we're outdoors somebody can get seriously injured um, and to risk assess something like about how to take people outdoors uh, from a, a, a lecture room, a classroom, a laboratory, or such like, is really, really easy work. And yet, it seems like it's such a huge thing for people to undertake in much of the university. That's what we're trying to break. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the future. Um, okay. Uh, what, our own research. What did I do there? That's a mistake. Sorry, I've talked about that already. Institutional engagement. This is key. You know, you can't just, we can't just, we don't believe we can just teach our programmes the, the way we have been and simply think that uh, the world will be a better place just because we've had lovely students working with us. We do want to change the institution. We do want to engage with it. Richard talked very well and has been a great supporter of our at work and he talked very well about the um, the curriculum transformation project um, and the role of outdoor education outdoor learning uh, learning for sustainability in it so um, there is opportunities there the digital age well do you know I uh, even even a such a short time ago as I don't know five years ago I, I was a dinosaur. I was telling people, don't take your phones out, you know, get your iPads in, you get your, you're not allowed to use them. And now, of course, that, I believe that was the wrong approach. There are so many opportunities uh, within the digital age that, um, that provide opportunities and are not, and are not threats. These need explored. Um, we've done a lot of work on, excuse me, <coughs> hybridity. Um, and, uh, I, and I think that other colleagues, um, and we're working hard with our digital colleagues too, so that these, these are not boundaries, they're, they're, they're bridges uh, between different discipline, disciplinary areas. 
and we think we've got a large uh, contribution to make to <coughs> digital education. So too green space, blue space, and, and in some of my own work, can we actually love concrete? Can we get our students to love concrete? Can we get them to love their cities <coughs> in a way that um, we can develop better educational responses within our cities where, where more of our people live uh, increasingly? Excuse me. <coughs> and then uh, health, well-being, health. Now there's a thing, I'll need to stop coughing. Health, well-being and the big things for us as we look forward are ecological sustainability and learning for sustainability. So with that in mind, um, <coughs> excuse me, I wanted to, I'm just going to mute to have a pro proper cough and then I do need to change um, my slides to something else. So if I can just find the Okay, because I want to do something else now. Um, and let me see, I need to change a few things around here. Okay, because this is a bit of a surprise part of the programs. Um, the surprise part of the program. Right, and I need your help um, here again. Right, now, when Pete Higgins um, left the stage, I heard a lot of whooping and hollering. Goodness knows what that was all about. I actually fell asleep um, during this presentation. Um, so I don't know what you're all whooping and hollering about, but anyway, what I'd like you to do is, um, again, whoop and holler if you can see him. Is he in the room? Just tell me, whoop and holler. I need to hear you. Is Pete Higgins in the room? I need you to whoop and holler. I think I can hear some noise. Right. I'm going to assume that uh, Pete Higgins is, is in the room. Uh, and if, if you're there, Pete, uh, uh, and you're, you're not actually falling asleep because it's now me talking, which is what I thought you might do is um, exactly that. So. Uh, assuming that you're in the room, um, apologies to you for the overly extravagant ferreting around for your attention, uh, but if you could indulge me for just a minute or two, right? So, like footballers approaching a certain vintage, uh, they become the centre of attention uh, because they're at the top of their game. And very often a testimonial match is played in their honour. Right, now don't worry, Pete, we're not asking you or our friends gathered here to look out your shirt, your shorts, your socks, and your old Bobby Charlton studs for a kick around. However, I say to you friends, colleagues, students and alumni, that in recognition of Pete's 30 years service, yes, 30 years, we ought to pay tribute to him through our own version of a testimonial because from, the when, from when the time he arrived, when he balanced on the shoulders of his own heroes, Nev and John, Ali, and so on, he's remained the steadfast cornerstone around which everything we are here to celebrate today was built upon. Pete, I suspect that we're going to be in big trouble for this because you never seem comfortable uh, with others placing you in the limelight, but we felt this exception was necessary. We looked for some of your students from down the generations who had something to say about the impact your teaching has had upon them. We identified four alumni representing the four different decades that you have taught here to say something nice about you. If we have got the mood music wrong about this and you feel mortally embarrassed, we do apologise, but it's not them to blame, but us, your so-called teammates. And so can I ask Phil Watkins up on stage? Phil was part 
of what Phil was part of Pete's first ever student cohort in 1992. Phil, over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, this is going to be impossible because Nev has asked me to keep it four minutes. I've never spoken for four minutes in my life, ever. I, uh, <laughs> I did take... Um, advice about the dress and uh, it did say dress down so I did you don't have to applaud at the end of this because I noted you're all quite embarrassed to actually whoop, holler and clap but it all began for me in 1992 when as a mature student and why I was called one of those just because I was 42 I certainly wasn't mature um, I came to Cramond I was interviewed originally by Nev and then I started the first course with As we came out of the opening address by the then Richard and walked along the corridor to the classroom, I sensed this salmon coming up behind me. <laughs> he arrived at my side, never met the bloke in my life, and handed me a carrier bag. It was full of the most appalling ties I've ever seen. And he said, would you do me a favour? When we get in the classroom, I'm going to ask you to teach the class put the ties on. I'd been teaching for 15 years, outdoor education and other things. Um, I was military then. And the military way of teaching is edict. That's what we do because it works. You can't muck about with all this laissez-faire, cuddly stuff. Man with a gun, tell him what to do and he'll do it. Well, I went through the routine that I thought was excellent. It would be because I've been doing it so long. Ah. Oh boy, did I get ripped. He did it very politely, and thank you for that, Peter. I got him back later. But he tore me to pieces. 30 years on, rightly so, but at the time I was crestfallen. Over the next few days, weeks, months, and a couple of years, I actually worked out that teaching wasn't about me. It was actually about the people I was teaching. Anyway, full of enthusiasm and a little bit of naivety, I shot back to my centre where I worked in Bavaria, a small little centre with 120 instructors, and I started giving the little bag with all the ties in to all my students, or my instructors, to give to their students. I needed a bit of reinforcement. I invited Pete over to help me, and that seemed to do the trick with my then bosses um, to carry on with the program. It wasn't easy going. Working from a bottom-up process of changing things because in the military we do outdoor education just the same, except for it's not just the same. We teach it differently, we use it for different reasons, and actually, yeah, I guess we got it wrong. It was hard work. However, over the years that followed that, through some luck and some promotions, I ended up with my dream, jo dream job, which was the commander of the physical and adventurous training in the British Army. Suddenly, I could do a top-down approach and tell those buggers what I wanted them to do. And so, um, the whole of the outdoor education program, the Joint Service Mountain Training Centres, started focusing more on soft skill development and using the outdoors as a way, as an enabler, to produce those skills we really wanted. So that was down to Pete. And of course, a little bit of help from Murray House and Cramon. Life was rosy, we were getting there. It takes a long time to change anything in the military. As I came to the end of my career, age 60, um, we'd managed to transfer this learning and this Murray House concept from the adventurous training world into pure teaching. And as, just as I was leaving 
we opened up the first school um, in the army for learning development, where every single teacher and instructor in the army who was going to teach recruits would have to go through this regime that was all about that damn bag with the ties in. So Peter, he changed my life, the Army's life, and certainly my career, and I'm much better off for it. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, um, so I'm Beth Christie and because Robbie has COVID, I am having to step in and take over this part. So what I'd like to do is invite up a student, um, former student, Mary Collicott. I'm scanning the audience to see where she is. There she is. Mary was a student with us in the 2010s. Um, uh, I'm hopefully I'll keep to time um, I only ever do public speaking usually after following on from Pete so I'm quite good at, um, at keeping things brief um, <laughs> but um, uh, I think a, a theme from uh, from Phil's uh, words there as well is um, I want to talk about uh, Pete as a change maker um, I'm sure that everyone who's here um, and in, who knows Pete uh, knows that that he is a change maker um, he makes things happen he sees where there's an opportunity for change and he puts things in place for it to happen. Um, he does this on a grand scale, as we know from his huge impact on uh, LFS policy in Scotland, um, but he also does it on a personal level. Um, I would not be where I am today doing what I do um, with what I think is the best job in the world, um, working with the most incredible people in the world, um, if it were not for him. Um, and his ability to see people uh, to see the potential in people and to see the connections that can be made between people. Um, his ability to, to put people together in ways that allow them to achieve their potential. Um, and I think for me that is one of the things that, um, that Pete has had a huge impact on in my life is, um, is supporting me and also um, making change or contributing to change. Um, so I wanted to sort of to share a little uh, story with you from the early days of, uh, of when I was studying to do the OESE Masters. Um, and I was completing my assignment for the Interpreting the Landscape um, course. Um, I submitted my assignment, the first assignment we had on the course, and we were told to sort of um, submit a practice to turn it in, the sort of university online submission system to sort of check that everything was working and um, to just do it sort of a few days before the deadline. So I, I did that for my ITL assignment. And unfortunately, there was some sort of computer crash. Uh, the whole system went down um, over the weekend, and so Pete quite happily marked my draft essay as my final submission. Um, and in anyone who's had an essay marked by Pete knows the, uh, the detailed feedback um, and the meticulous feedback that he gives you, um, which very politely sort of said he wasn't quite sure what the sort of multiple question marks in brackets stood for, um, and he didn't quite understand the, the system of my colour coding because huge parts of my essay were sort of highlighted in yellow with brackets afterwards saying insert reference here. And um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I was mortified um, to discover this. Um, Pete was like, it's fine, it's fine. Let's just, it was good, let's leave it at that. Um, I insisted that I be allowed to, to resubmit my final essay um, and have that mark um, and, and be graded on that. Um, and what I didn't learn from that experience, um, which I've later tried to learn um, from Pete and something that he's said to me multiple times, um, which is, um, Sometimes done is better than perfect. Um, and sometimes I struggle, I think, as, as many of us do, to get things done. Um, but I think that Pete is somebody who gets things done. And actually, sometimes done is better than perfect. A lot of the time, done is better than perfect. Um, and it's definitely something that I hear uh, his voice in my head um, saying most of the time when I'm trying to um, finish things off and complete things. Um, because somebody who achieves the sorts of things that Pete manages to achieve really is something to aspire to. And I think that um, if we all got done as much as Pete does, then the world would be just a little bit closer to perfect. Thank you. 
Pete, can I just point out, this was Robbie's idea. Even though I'm standing here, this was Robbie's idea. I can see he's scowling in the corner. Okay, there's more, you'll be pleased to know. So we have another student now, um, Sophie Coates. Sophie was a... <laughs> Sophie was a student with us in the 2020s. Okay. They've even brought the food out now, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to try and motor. Um, yeah, I graduated last year, actually, from the Learning for Sustainability Masters. Um, I confess I actually started it several years ago. I took the full six years. Um, and I think it was about six years ago that I did Pete's Ecosystems for Educators course. And as a mostly residential kind of outdoor course, I remember it as being a, a, a lovely experience of <coughs> finely distilled eco-nerdiness from all sides. It was great. And I've uh, run into him since on a, a number of other courses in the Masters and uh, also while working on a professional learning course and a MOOC alongside too many illustrious folk to mention. Um, when I thought about what I'd taken away from learning with and working with Pete for the purposes of this testimonial, uh, I did actually have it boiled down to a kind of handful of nuggets of wisdom, which I was going to invite you to think of as Higgins Nuggets, <laughs> TM. But when I read it out loud, it sounded like a eulogy. So I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to tell you about my original failed idea instead, because um, you see, I'd originally thought of I do actually have a slide of this somewhere, two slides. The first one's black because there's a reveal. I, I thought of um, printing him a T-shirt. It's niche, but. Um, Oh, yeah, there it is. So, oh, I hadn't actually done the reveal. Never mind, it's fine. Um, yeah, so a lot of us have done, sorry, Pete Higgins' courses here, and so many of us will probably know that he's a big fan of biogeochemical cycles. They were certainly brought up a few times on the Ecosystems for Educators course with a, the gleam of a zealot in his eye. And uh, it was mentioned that it would be great to have a T-shirt that said, I am a biogeochemical cycle. So I thought, this is it, this is my idea. I got out my colouring pencils, I'm a geography teacher, and started working. Actually, I, I cannibalised the design from a number of places on the internet. And then I had some crippling doubts, not just because of the art history. I, uh, I thought, does a person who is so conscious of waste that, for example, I once heard him deliver a brief monologue uh, on how best, for example, funeral homes could dispose of human remains by composting, after chopping them up. Does this guy really want another t-shirt? I thought it, I shouldn't be contributing to fast fashion with a potentially throwaway novelty purchase. So I thought I'd work it into the speech elsewhere by saying you should patent the idea, but then that has connotations of consumerism that we're trying to unlearn. <sighs> and then I thought if he's going to be uncomfortable with the testimonials, maybe a gift is actually unforgivable. But this is kind of, in a nutshell, what I have taken from, from learning and working with Pete. Um, that, that kind of challenging of ideas and the critical thinking to a sometimes excruciating extent. Um, considering other perspectives, I know that one's a bit of a stretch, but it's important and I wanted to include it. Um, making sustainable choices, because sustainability education is one of these things that filters into all aspects of your life. Uh, staying humble. Pete's anecdotes about trying to live his work and be the change he wants to see, but not always succeeding, really resonated with me. And finally, all this is just underpinned by so much enthusiasm for the subject and the job. I mean, and it's so inspiring. And while I haven't actually made it back into a classroom since having children, indoor or outdoor, I know I will because the masters and my work on the online courses have kept my joy of learning and teaching alive. So, Pete, I didn't get your t-shirt. Dodge that bullet. <laughs> but uh, I would like to give you a gift, just as a thank you for encouraging me to, in my own small way, be the change I want to see. Um, so it's my original colored pencil. I mean, I say original, but like I said, it's taken from the internet drawing. And because, you know, I want to avoid waste too, it's on the back of a 2001 Tariff Academy desk planner. So I still think it's the gift you'd prefer. So thank you very much. OK, 
Okay, we have another um, student that is joining us. Hopefully, um, this will appear on the screen. It's a video. This is John Telford. He was a student with us in the 2000s. Some of you might recognize him because of Pete's um, presentation. You'll have seen that John actually came on to be a lecturer, so he may have taught some of you in the room. Hopefully, it will come on. I'm getting a thumbs up. Hi Pete, I've been asked to say a few words in recognition of your role at Murray House and specifically about how your teaching has influenced me since I was a student on the outdoor education diploma there uh, just over 20 years ago. It feels like a great honour and an impossible task to say everything that could be said but um, here it goes. When I was thinking of what to say, I first of all thought about starting off by rushing in from the side of the screen and talking about how I was sorry I was late but I just had a call at three in the morning to attend an emergency UN meeting in Switzerland. So it had been a bit of a rush what with making the kids pack lunches and asking my wife's advice on what to put in the speech to the delegation. Which of course what she said was genius and far better than anything I was going to say and she should have gone instead of me. But I went anyway and uh, marked three PhDs on the plane there and I wrote a research grant application in a taxi from the airport because it needed to be in in the next five minutes. And then I biked and sailed home because the carbon footprint otherwise would have been utterly unconscionable. And I'd only gone to bed at 2am because there was a once in a millennium meteor shower passing through the sky last night that I had to observe. And before that I needed to finish the feedback to the students' feedback to my feedback about their feedback on the assignments that I'd given them just oh, 13 pages of feedback on to get started. I'd been in a rush so I didn't have time to write anything more than just a few opening remarks. And then I woke up because I was thinking about mapping out a strategy paper for the next national curriculum review. So I made a mental note of some of those thoughts which all fit together in a sort of DNA helix. So it's actually quite hard to know where to begin to explain it all. But Pete, I won't do that because I think that might be poking a little too much fun at someone that I respect and appreciate immensely. Even though I know you'll realize that that little caricature monologue is actually a list of compliments that describes some of the things that make you such a great teacher. I think perhaps all good outdoor educators are generalists. I read somewhere once about the great value of generalists, that being one shouldn't be considered a pejorative term. The generalist doesn't have world-leading specific knowledge in one minute field. What they do have, and their irreplaceable value, is a breadth and depth of knowledge that gives them credibility across many fields and the ability to see the connections between those fields without which the greater whole is invisible. They're the sort of guardians of maintaining focus on the beauty of the whole and championing the vital importance of its integrity. They're the sort of people who get involved in solving wicked problems like environmental sustainability perhaps, or pushing for education systems to provide multifaceted teaching and learning experiences that allow all students to flourish. I've heard you say many times, Pete, that you think you don't really know anything. But clearly that's not true. You know a great deal about many things. And I think one of your great gifts is your ability to pull that knowledge together and draw people in to see how a multitude of things relate to each other and to inspire people to go on and find out more and to do something with that knowledge. Pete, I left your office on the old Cramond campus just over 20 years ago after having tracked you down to find out some information about the programme. And anyone who knows you that will know that tracking you down is no easy task. I think of you sort of like an electron. It's not possible to know exactly where you'll be at any given time. I think your location can only be guessed at through a sort of complex equation of probability or perhaps a fleeting glimpse of a 40-year-old rucksack disappearing around the corner of the corridor. But when someone does manage to pin you down, despite your ridiculously busy schedule, you somehow find a way to carve out time to be entirely focused on that moment and the finest details of that conversation to an almost extravagant degree. I left your office after about an hour's conversation, fully convinced that I was going to leave a job I really enjoyed in Glasgow and would enrol in the programme that September. And that's what I did. And it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. The program and significantly your teaching opened up my eyes to a whole new way of thinking about the possibilities of outdoor education 
and 20 something years later I'm still working in the field and building on what I learned then. So thank you Pete, you've been an amazing and inspiring example to follow and I'm sure you will continue to be so for a long time yet. I'm sorry I can't be there in person to say all this and there's much more that I could say but I look forward to being able to do that when I catch up with you in person hopefully before too long. Enjoy the celebrations and try not to be too uncomfortable about the attention on you right now. Take care. I think anyone of us that's in this room and anyone that's joining online, even people that can't make it here tonight, could probably stand up and say a good few words and probably sing your praises long into the night, Pete. I know you're shaking your head. I've got five pages. I don't. I don't have five pages. <laughs> but I think it's important for you to know the, the impact, the breadth, the depth, the impact of your teaching. Something I've noticed and quite a few people have noticed over the years of working with you is that when the spotlight is on you, um, and when it shines on you, you're very quick to turn it round, to shine it onto everyone else in the room, such as the way that you work, that you always are thinking about the collective and about the team. And I know that's what, you're, what you do, but I also know that underneath, you just don't like the spotlight being on you. So I know you'll be feeling uncomfortable, and this is not pleasant for you. Hang in there. There's a wee bit more. <laughs> I want you to, to just take this and just take this moment just to appreciate the, the, what is coming towards you, um, which is a lot of warmth, a lot of admiration, a lot of respect, a lot of gratitude for your teaching, for your guidance, for your wisdom, for your vision, but I think above all else, I think it's your kindness and the generosity I'm not going to get emotional. It's a dry mouth, honestly. Um, your generosity over the past uh, 30 years. So I just want to take a moment and ask everyone if they'll, well, you don't maybe have a glass, but we can raise a cheer and a toast to Pete. And this is for the first, the first 50 years, okay? So everyone, to Pete. we're such a good team, if I can be a bit of a critical friend to, to Robbie in the introduction to the testimonial, there was one little thing he didn't notice. He didn't notice. It was probably in the small print. There's no holiday entitlement with this testimonial, Pete, so you'll be back at work Monday morning, 6.30. I want you on your emails, but you're probably on your laptop at the back of the room and you've sent me 40 anyway, so. <laughs> but thank you. And I want to hand over now to, to Heidi Smith, the Programme Director. Um, Julia with me here is an alumni and we wanted to just share some of our visions for the future of alumni connection. Tonight is a celebration of the programs and alumni and current students and we wanted to just give you a little bit of direction as to what we hope to do moving into the future and it's not something we plan to do alone and we will need all of your assistance to do that. So um, in 2020 when COVID was happening we took the opportunity to send out a survey and many people, many of you answered that survey and one of the re and, and being here tonight is a result of, of that survey. Um, we surveyed over 800 alumni in over 30 countries and that shows that we really are a truly global community. Um, this event tonight is a springboard for what we hope for the future to have more connection between alumni, current students and new students coming in. Our alumni, you have shown that you're interested in connecting, networking, collaborating, careers opportunities, sharing knowledge and skills and resources. So some projects that we hope to start in this 50th year as we go forward is, uh, one is a scholarship 
um, or stipend that is a pay it forward, supported and funded by alumni for incoming students. We're not quite sure what that looks like, but we hope you'll help us shape that. An online community space where we can really share on a global space different offerings, opportunities, resources, network with each other so we can continue to achieve what we all set out to achieve individually, but to do that collectively. And at the heart of this space is a memory bank, which Julia is going to talk to you a little bit more about. So as Heidi already mentioned, in the past few months, we were thinking about um, how to create an online space that enables us to connect as this great alumni community. We were thinking about it as a space to network, collaborate, share best practice and learning, knowledges, resources and skills. Some examples. What are the tips and tricks for recording a podcast on wilderness? Or what are the best online tools to engage people in their local outdoor spaces? These are just some questions that I got answered really brilliantly and creatively with the help of my former cohort. So expanding the support network to the entire OEE alumni community would be super exciting and helpful. But how to create an engaging and interactive space like that? We didn't want it to be this blank page with the occasional tumbleweed rolling through, but rather an attractive platform that really fosters creative exchange. So this is when the idea of the memory bank was born. We thought of it as the visual heart of this networking platform, representing our collective ideas as OEE students. So we would like to invite you to share your experience from the program, either through photos, artworks, written or spoken word, or anything that captures your time on the program. You will receive further information as well as a link to a submission platform via email. If you have any further questions about the future plans or the memory bank, feel free to talk to Heidi or me about it tonight or any other time. Thank you very much and we're really looking forward to your contributions. Thanks. <laughs> We're starting to come to the end of our evening and I'd like to return by handing back to Professor Richard Andrews who's going to bring our evening to a bit of a close. This has been a great evening. I'm going to finish with two short poems. The first one is for you all. It's about rum. Uh, Pete encouraged me to go off and visit a fairly isolated small beach called Samvan Inshir, and uh, here's what I wrote. No two people ever walk the same path. No birds fly the same itinerary. Here there's no path across Glach Moor from Kilmory Beach to Samvan Inshir. I can see Kanar and far off Uist from the nameless rocks above the beach. A ferry draws a white line between here and sky, Refer reference points of a sort, though no guide to the bog. Better definition comes from the orchestration of birdsong, snipe, a cuckoo, sandpipers, dunnocks. A flotilla of geese announces its arrival on the shore. And then a man and a woman appear as if from nowhere, as if from Eden, and walk separately to different parts of the beach. He to the waterline, she upstream to the stones that cross the Kilmory River. And my second one, uh, how can I put it? This one's for Pete, uh, and it's entitled Bog Ashfordell, because we very, those students and I who have had the privilege of hearing Pete stop on our nature walk and expound about the Bog Ashfordell, that was a key moment for me. So the first two stanzas, very short, are quite scientific. This, the, the third and last one is more, if you like, poetic, etymological. Here we go. Bog Ashfordell. Nothenium ossifragum. You short, low, hairless, perennial, you bone breaker. Sword-shaped, iris-like leaves in rather flattened tufts, often tinted orange. Flowers, star-like. Six petaled in spikes on leafless stems. The Scottish Ashfordell, Tophelia Priscilla, that's small, tiny, wee, has greenish yellow flowers with a green three lobed bract 
in a short spike. Grows in wet places on mountains and in tundra. And yet, the etymology reveals more. Bog means soft, from the Gaelic bogach, meaning soft ground. In turn, that's from the pro-Celtic bugo, meaning flexible. And then further back, from Sanskrit, and the pro-Indo-European bujati, meaning to bend, to be pliable. And as for Ashvadel, that's a lily remembered beyond the tomb. With that, that's my tribute to you, Pete. Thank you so much, everyone. I think the fantastic thing about this evening and why I'm really optimistic about the whole field you work in is young people, people coming through our courses, going on, becoming teachers, acting in other ways. And I think there's huge hope in the way children and young people are interpreting this world. And I look forward to uh, that realizing itself ever more strongly for us. Uh, here in Scotland and more broadly. So thank you to everyone for a fantastic evening. Thank you. Thank you to all of tonight's speakers for sharing memories and dreams of outdoor environmental education. It's amazing to hear where it's all started and how we've developed thus far. We would also like to say a big thank you to Allison Parker, Program Director Dr. Heidi Smith, and members of the Alumni Working Group for the time, dedication, and work they have and continue to do for tonight and in moving our OEE community forward. Thank you. Um, I'd like to remind you about the OEE Snapshot Challenge. Um, please continue to create capture, share, and connect the essence of OEE and the program using the hashtag OEE50. There's a theme here. I don't know if you picked up on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and sadly, it is now time to say farewell to those who have joined us through Zoom. Thank you for being with us, and we hope to see you all soon in person, either here in Scotland or wherever we may meet. I don't know if they're... <laughs> <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> Uh, for the rest of us, um, the drinks reception will be starting shortly. Woo! <laughs> um, please enjoy and make use of the outside space in between those Scottish showers. Um, continue, to have, continue to have conversations and continue to connect with one another. Um, after dinner, the, in the VIP Holland room, which is just up the big stairs there, there's a, going to be a Vox Pops filming setup. Um, please pay it a visit to share your memories, stories, and experiences of OEE. Keep in mind that dinner will begin at 8 p.m., followed by the Cayley here in the South Hall. And one final reminder that there will be a gathering at Portobello Beach tomorrow at 11, and no worries if you haven't signed up. Thank you again for being with us tonight, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Slanjava! <laughs>have a few thank yous and a few gifts we'd like to hand out this evening and then we really will stop talking. <laughs> um, first of all we'd like to thank the alumni working group who has been working tirelessly in the background. Um, they answered the call for help instantly and have been working really really hard and I know will continue to work with us as we move forward. So Helen and Julia could I invite you up? Beth has something for you. done this alone, Nush has been there with them, but she also answered the call to MC tonight, so can we thank Nush? Someone else who always says yes when I call for help 
is Morgan, and I think we can all agree she did a wonderful night to job tonight, emceeing with Nush. But I think all of you know someone here who you might not have met, and she, like Pete Higgins, likes to hide in the background. Well, none of us would be here tonight if it was not for Alison, and I would not be so calm and collected were it not for Alison. She has thought of everything down to the last detail. She's an incredible woman to work with, and I rue the day that she ever decides to leave us. Um, she's a current student, she works our placements, and tonight is a testament to her, but it's not just tonight, it's the vision for our alumni connection into the future. So Alison, we could not have done this without you, and it has been an absolute pleasure, and thank you so much. That's all from us now, so please um, talk to each other. The food's going to come out soon, and um, don't forget the Kaylee later. So please enjoy the evening. <laughs>